Gallaudet University presents. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to this auspicious occasion, Black Death PhDs. Many of you know this month is Black History Month, of course. And Black History Month is often filled with a lot of historical events and many different things that we like to pay attention to. There are many, many micro achievements that are important to mark during this month. And we wanted to bring together a panel of the doctoral, the African American doctoral recipients. Historically, we have approximately 12. We will have nine of them present with us today, and they are processing in even as we speak. Thank you all for coming today. This is Dr. Angela Muscaskill. This is such an exciting time for us to be able to show our numbers, to show the number of, um, of everyone here, the black deaf students, undergraduate, high school students, that one day you can be wearing this robe. And for all of you black deaf students and for all Gallaudet students, so you can be able to achieve what we have. We look forward to being able to share our experiences with you. We're the MCs today, and we'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Brianna Johnson, and I'm majoring in government. I'm a senior, and I also founded Bisons with Attitudes, which is a dance club, and I was also former, a former Miss Black Deaf America. I'm Brandon Williams, and I'm a junior here at Gallaudet, majoring in social work and minoring in English. I'm also the student body government director of diversity. Hello, my name is Elena Ruiz. I'm a Deaf Cultural Studies um, graduate student, and I'm also the Office of Diversity and Inclusion graduate assistant. Hello, I'm Erica Baylor. I'm a second year student, and I'm majoring in social work. I'm the BDSU uh, president of that organization. Welcome, everyone. Please also welcome Dr. Nefriti Fellows, Correction of the Interpretation, Nefriti. Also, please welcome Dr. Lorene Sims. Next, we'd like to welcome Dr. Angela McCaskill. We'd also like to welcome Dr. Carolyn McCaskill. Come 
next to your here. sister. Next, Dr. Raymond Merritt. Next, we have Dr. Ernest Hairston. Next, we'd like to um, introduce Dr. Khadijat Rashid. Please welcome Dr. S Simon Gutang. Dr. Isaac Agbula was not able to be with us today, and we wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to clarify and give some explanation about the different doctoral degrees. Um, there is a Doctor of Philosophy, which is a PhD. It is the highest possible degree that a person can receive here in the United States. The next doctoral degree is a Doctor of Education in EDD. Um, that includes persons who are specializing in the discipline of education. Uh, as far as um, PhD requirements, you have to do certain types of research. And with education, you also have different types of research options. Um, there are also other degrees that are conferred, Juris Doctor, a JD, which is uh, someone who is specializing in the field of law. And I'd also like to explain the difference between earning a degree and being conferred an honorary degree. When you earn a degree, that means that you actually entered a PhD program and went through the course requirements and did your dissertation and your research requirements in order to fulfill that. An honorary degree means that a university recognizes a person who is a shining example of their discipline and of their field and they're conferred that degree because of the work that they have done. So those are the degrees that are conferred to the different recipients that we have today. Now we'd like to continue on with our panel questions. Are you guys ready? Are, do, are our panelists ready for that? Everyone ready for your questions? Everybody got their, their brains turned on? Ready, <laughs> ready, got my fingers crossed. Okay, very good. So our first question that we'd like to ask is, what motivated you to pursue a Doctor of Philosophy degree, a PhD? Would you like us to, Dr. Lorreen Sames is asking, would you like us to go in a particular order? Dr. Carolyn McCaskill says I'm going to stand. Can everyone see me? There were two reasons that I chose to pursue this degree. Dr. Glenn Anderson, our first black deaf doctoral candidate, when I spoke with him, I always admired his pursuit of the degree. And one day the two of us had a conversation and he reminded me that I was to get a PhD. And of course I said to him, there ain't no way I'm gonna do that. I'm done with school, I'm done with reading, I is is not happening. I am not interested. And he of course looked at me skeptically and said, we can count on one hand how many black people, black deaf people there are with PhDs. And he said, I'm lonely. I'm very, very lonely. So I continued to think about it. And sometime later, years went by, when I applied for a position as a deaf, in the Deaf Studies Department to become a faculty member, my department said to me, all right, Carolyn, it's time for you to get your PhD. And so at that point, I had no choice 
So really there were two reasons behind me doing it. I didn't want Glenn to be lonely anymore and my department gave me a directive. Elena, anyone else like to comment on that question? Dr. Hearson is saying, what motivated me was actually my boss, Dr. Malcolm Neward. He's actually, um, was the chief of, uh, um, chief of captioning at that time. And what happened is that he had gotten his PhD after he had gotten an honorary degree from Gallaudet University. And I asked him why he pursued that even though he had already been conferred an honorary degree. And uh, Mac, um, as we call him, he said, well, I had this huge meeting with all these people who were hearing, and there was one man that said, Mr. Norwood, do you have a PhD? And you know, Mac sat back and he really couldn't answer that question. So he decided to go to University of Maryland and get his PhD at that time. So the next time at the meeting, someone asked him, Mr. Norwood, do you have a PhD? And Mac was saying, you know what, you do and so do I. So he, it was really impressive he was able to answer that question. And um, of course, there wasn't any more promotions at that time, um, even though he had a PhD. And so he was saying it didn't matter to him. He went ahead and did what he needed to do. He said, so what? You know, I got have a PhD too. So he was able to answer his critics right back. I have three reasons that motivated me to get my PhD. The first was my uh, personal decision. When I was in my last year of high school, I was having a discussion with my friends about the future. And we all talked about the idea of getting our PhDs and when that would happen. And so we decided that at 35, we would have our PhDs. So I came to Gallaudet and worked hard to pursue my getting a PhD with that goal in mind. Sometimes I would get sidetracked, certainly, but I kept my mind on my goal. The second reason was once I had finished my master's degree, I went to go teach at a school for the deaf in Arizona. The experience was incredibly rich. The first year of teaching brought with it many challenges. There were many things that I realized I didn't know. So I thought once I had a good number of years of experience, then I would like to go on to uh, get my PhD. And so after satisfying my years of experience, I went to go get my PhD. My third reason was during a missionary week at my church. So we were talking about missionaries, missionaries in Africa, and there were photos of missionaries working with different Africans, both poor and rich. So I sat back and I wondered, what about those deaf Africans? Who's reaching out to them? Who is working with them to break the barriers that they're experiencing in, in Africa? And then finally, my, chap, my, my pastor uh, preached from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8. And so in that verse it says, um, who will I send forth? And it, the scripture says that Isaiah the prophet answered that, yes, here I am, send me. So I decided to, um, because of that, what my pastor said, to, um, mot that motivated me to go to Africa and to help um, African deaf be able to progress. Beautiful story. When that question was posed to me, I thought back to the many years ago when I first considered getting a PhD in the 1990s. And I know it was before some of you were even born, but we won't go there. I taught in an elementary school classroom for many, many years, and I loved teaching in the classroom. There's nothing that beats that. And I plan to continue that until I ended my career. And during the time, we had many visitors come through the deaf school to show off the kids, and often they came through my classroom to observe how I taught. And I primarily taught first grade at the time. 
And I saw these people coming through and wondered why they were observing me. My students paid rapt attention while I was working. And they asked at one point if I would mentor other teachers in teaching reading and writing to my students. Now, my background is in elementary ed education, so I know how to teach children literacy. Doesn't matter whether they're deaf or hearing. And I told them, no thank you. I plan to teach until I die. I had no interest in mentoring new teachers. And my principal continued to implore me to do that. There were other students in my class who needed me, and finally I decided that I needed to do that and move into a supervisory role. So weekly we had gatherings where we consulted about teaching children literacy skills and working with them and so forth, and I realized that I wanted to study more about how to train teachers. I needed to get more education myself on the pedagogy of teaching. So I went to the University of Arizona, and there were there's a famous teacher training program there. It's one of the top programs in the United States, preparing teachers in teaching teachers. So I went there to take the program, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I completed my work, and then I went to Western Oregon University. And they offered me a job in teacher preparation. And I still got to teach, so I was very excited about that. And so that was the moment. I never thought I would be out of the classroom. And had it not been for that principal continuing to motivate me, I thought that I was going to be in the elementary classroom teaching until I die. Ultimately, I still am teaching until I die, just in a different level. This is Dr. Fellows. For those of you um, who, who don't know me, um, school hasn't really been my thing. Um, really, I, what started motivating me was starting to teach here in English. I believe it was 99, 2000. And I just realized that I really loved the college level classroom instruction that I was doing. Um, so teaching high school was much different than teaching here in college. And I realized in order to fulfill the requirements, I had to have a PhD. So Dr. Car Dr. Carolyn Lasasso was the one that encouraged me and told me that I needed to earn my PhD in order to continue teaching here. And so I worked with college level students. I also um, uh, continued um, being motivated by my teaching and by the students that I, that I work with. Well, I've always been very much involved in the community as a social worker. And I've worked in providing individual and family therapy. I also worked to operate support groups and traveled uh, giving workshops uh, related to social work and supporting family and individuals. Eventually, I decided to go back to school uh, part-time while I was working within the community. And I was working to get my master's in social work. And at that point, I had gotten a job offer to teach one course as an adjunct, and so I did that. And uh, it was an evening course that I taught, and I realized how much I enjoyed it. I did it for another semester after that, and Dr. Janet Prey at that time was the chair of the Department of Social Work. And she recognized the very positive evaluations I had gotten from the students, and she encouraged me to consider teaching more. At the time, though, I was very involved with the community, with the National Black Deaf Advocates Organization, and in my social work. But once there was a position available in the department, I applied. However, I was warned that that position requires a PhD. So uh, I was okay with that, and I started teaching, and then my chair encouraged me to start taking some doctoral courses. I started to do that. And I immediately recognized that I had a high need for knowledge and more information, more development of the theories that we were using in our work, but to be able to practice them, apply them, and teach them. And so that's why I went into the PhD program this is Elena. Thank you so very much um, for that. It's already ex we haven't even started yet, and um, just going to our second question. We're so excited um, to continue the discussion. 
So we currently, data currently indicates that there are approximately 12 known black deaf people in the US with PhDs. So what does it feel like to be part of such an illustrious group? I feel proud of myself and at the same time, I feel a bit dejected. It's 2012 and we have a total of 12 known black deaf people with doctoral degrees. It's sad. And I want all of the students, how many of you are from Kendall School here? How many from Kendall School? Please show your hands. And how many from MSSD? Let me see. How many from Gallaudet? Where are you? We hosted this panel to let you know that if you dream it, you can achieve it. I grew up very, very poor. And I learned to have faith in myself. And I developed a support group to help me through this process. So you have to dream. And you can achieve. The number 12 is really, really quite sad. We have mentors for you. We'll have support for you. And it's very important that you believe in yourself. But first, you have to dream that you can accomplish it. I'm proud to be one of 12. But I want to see more of us in the pipeline. This is Dr. Rashid. I'm in total agreement with Dr. McCaskill. When they told me that the number was 12, I was in complete shock that we were only 12, such a small group. Um, at the same time, honestly, um, you know, I can't be too proud. I have teenage kids, and every day I talk to them, you know, they kind of pop my, pop my balloon there, um, so I can't get too inflated or too proud about who I am or, or what I do. Um, the students that I work with on a daily basis and that I interact with challenge me. Um, do I think that I'm better? Do I think that I'm more intelligent than them? Of course not. I, do, I don't believe that. Um, as, as I look out in the audience, I see all of you here as students, all of you can achieve receiving a PhD. A PhD is not a measure of your intelligence, it's a measure of your determination. It's a measure of your stubbornness that you're not going to give up, that you're going to keep going and continue forward. So in my opinion, uh, if you're able to make it into college and get into do, um, completing a college education, you can get a PhD. Dr. McCaskill speaking. I also wanted to let you know there may be more out there that we're not aware of. For example, one professor, Dr. James from Howard University, is deaf, but he's oral and he doesn't sign. He has a PhD and he taught for many, many years. So I hope that there are more that we know of out in the community. And within the United States, we know of 12 internationally. Clearly, there are a lot more. This is Dr. Dr. Merritt. I would like to add to Dr. Rashid's comments. Um, as far as being able to achieve a PhD, isn't a guarantee that you're going to graduate and find a high-paying job and be able to financially support yourself and live the high life. Um, I received my PhD from the University of Maryland. When I graduated from there, the keynote speaker emphasized, and this really had an impact on me, that the reason that you're conferred this degree, it's, uh, it's an award, yes, and it's an honor. And you, as a recipient, need to view that PhD as a tool. That degree is a tool for you to utilize. So all of us has, you know, it's up to us individually whether or not we utilize that tool that has been given, it, given to us, that that really had an impact on me. So I feel very humble and honored, yes, to be in this position. Um, and I cannot say, I can, could not have achieved this without the support of my community, my family, of course. Um, I was able to achieve with their support. And while I was studying or pursuing my PhD, it was very difficult. Um, you know, it was a brutal experience for me um, that I went through. And I know that for everyone that might not be the case, but I'm so grateful to my community. When I graduated and finished, I started to look back and reminisce how the time went by so fast. And I really felt that, you know, I accomplished that, that I made it. Um, you know, for, for everyone, yes, but mostly you, for you guys, I want you to let you know that it is something that you can accomplish and something that you can do. Next question. As a person of color, 
What obstacles, if any, did you encounter while pursuing your PhD? When I started pursuing my PhD, there were several obstacles that I faced. Initially, I started taking courses to experience how it felt to enter a PhD program. I drove eight hours every week from Tucson, Arizona to Phoenix. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, I drove two hours to the university and back to the campus. So I drove over eight hours a week for an entire semester and I asked myself if I could keep up with that without moving. And it was very, very challenging. So initially it was very challenging for me. Now secondly, were the natural challenges. My wife was pregnant at the same time that I was pursuing my PhD. And she was on complete bed rest. And I made a decision, I had to make a decision about whether I was gonna persevere or to stay with my wife. And the two of us had a conversation about it. And we said, let's pray. And we presented three questions to God. And this is a true story in our prayer. We said, God, if, if this is really your will for me to be involved in the PhD program, then I'll get a job in Tucson, Arizona. Secondly, I'll get support from Gallaudet University. And thirdly, I will find a place in Arizona, in Tucson, where we're comfortable for my wife to be able to rest. And we gave God a deadline. I think it was April 25th, 1994, to be honest with you. And we prayed. We got all of our requests before April 25th. But still my wife was on bed rest. Now the final decision, I was able to stay with her and she told me, go to work. And when I came back, she said, Simon, let's go. I asked her, are you serious? And she said, let's go. You're on bed rest. She said, let's go. Let's walk on faith. In the scripture, Joshua was one of nine. Correction to the interpretation, chapter one, verse nine. God said, I will meet you wherever you go. And out of the blue, people showed up to help me. And things started to work out. So really, it was a challenge. But we persevered, and God made a way. So I'm really happy about that. So even challenges can become good. That's my experience. Elena, so yeah, we have one more response from the panel. This is Dr. Dr. Merritt. I'm um, looking back on my experiences. I mean, of course, we have the standard obstacles, for instance, being, um, of course, being part of a double minority, being black and deaf. Uh, but another thing that also affected me um, was, the, was the invisibility. Um, I mean, the diversity was always there. I've always accepted who I was. I'm biracial. And I've always accepted myself for who I am. When I went into my schools for the deaf, there was, in California, there was diversity there. And here in Gallaudet, um, there's lots of diversity. We, we have laws such as affirmative action in order to protect myself as, as a person of color and so on. Um, so after I graduated with my bachelor's, um, I was offered a position to, I was offered to get into graduate school. I was able to get through that and be able to, um, to, to achieve that. So some of those barriers that I had to overcome was that I was taken in, but mostly as a token. Um, um, I was taken in merely just for them to meet their quotas because I was black and deaf. So they needed to meet the diversity quotas. And so because of that, I started to feel invisible in that sense. I started to feel those visibility barriers, actually, um, because of my visibility of being who I was. I've, I was accepted who I was. 
um, so because I'm biracial, I can go between the two races. And what happens is that I'm kind of stuck in the middle because neither race accepts me for who I am. So I have this sort of um, visibility barrier that, um, that I have to overcome. So some of the barriers that I experienced um, <clears throat> were similar to many people's experiences as they're going through their uh, doctoral studies. It's not an easy process. But little did I know that uh, there would be some other issues, <clears throat> not necessarily related to uh, my skin color, but it was um, other people that sometimes I had to rely on them in order to um, finish deadlines and I wasn't able to do that. Or I had to accommodate the needs of systems within I was, which I was working and I wasn't able to do that. My dissertation uh, topic was a little bit controversial, so that was also a barrier for me. I felt like my topic was very important to the deaf community, to the field of education, and so those barriers uh, were very frustrating for me, and I had to fight through them. And, and, and in that experience, I had to find the strength to get through it. I'm done now. And I still think about these barriers that were a part of my experience. And a lot of people remind me to appreciate the fact that I have my PhD, and certainly I do. Um, but I just want to warn you all that, you know, it's not a walk in the, in the park. Things will come up along the way. So uh, we'd like to move it over to Erica for the next questions. Thank you uh, for answering the questions thus far. I'd like to ask this question now. Many students consider a master's degree to be their final goal in graduate school. In your opinion, what benefits does having a PhD provide Working that a for the Department of Education in the federal government? Many projects were handled, there were programs, we uh, oversaw many pro programs for people who have doctoral degrees. And all of the people who oversaw those programs had to be PhDs themselves in order to manage them. So when I first joined the government, PhDs weren't necessary to move up the ladder, only a master's was. But nowadays, it's very hard to get a management position without a doctoral degree in the government. People still work for the government, but if they want to be promoted into administrative positions, they have to have PhDs. Now, this was, fortunately for me, that wasn't the case, but it is true now. Dr. Rashid, um, one of the benefits is um, having a PhD is having a voice of authority. Um, obviously, people, if you have a PhD, people assume that you know that you know what you're talking about, but of course, that may not always be the case, but people assume such. Um, you know, you have a college education, you also have world knowledge, and you also have a PhD. As a black deaf woman, I know that often people look at me and they already have an idea of who they think I am. They've already made certain judgments based on um, stereotypes that they might have. Oh, well, this is another, um, you know, um, black woman. Um, so I already could read, basically read someone's mind when, they, when they're um, coming to me. So they tend to be condescending towards me um, just because of that. And so sometimes they say, Miss Rashid, and they say, you know what, that's doctor to you. And at that point, I shut them up, basically. So, I mean, it might seem kind of petty, but sometimes you want to leave people with that type of profession. Don't make any assumptions about who I am because you see me, I'm black, I'm deaf, and I'm a woman. Don't put me in any type of position in your mind where you think you are better than I am. So sometimes you just gotta put it out there like that. When I was a PhD student, I met one person named Jack Lambertson. And they, he already had a master's degree and was moving on toward the PhD. And at the time, he asked me why I had a PhD.
Having a master's degree is similar to a joystick. It allows you to go east and west. But with a PhD, you're able to go in any direction that you'd like to go. It doesn't matter. There's no restrictions. You have opportunities to flow in whatever direction you want to and to excel without even thinking about it. So that's the reason to get a PhD. However, I have to emphasize, having the degree, you can become overqualified. Thank so you for adding that. Thank you very much for adding that. Uh, well said. So it's not the answer to everything. It really isn't. Keep that in mind. This is Dr. Sims. Um, when comparing a master's degree and a PhD, I have to say that I really love my PhD degree. I am a nerd, so maybe that, that might be why. But the reason why I, I value a PhD so much is because a PhD is a reflection of my own thinking, my own research. This is all me. This is me out here. This is, I produced this degree myself. And this is from my own brain and my own thinking that I was able to produce this. That, so that's the challenge, um, to be able to um, theorize and you think on a, a much higher level. With a master's degree, usually what you have to do is do assignments for a teacher. You want so many pages, you want this type of report, you want this type of project, so you type it up and you hand it in for, for the professors, for them, to meet their requirements for graduation. So you're kind of like following, um, following them, following their own demands. But there's no, uh, now when I had a PhD, it's like, what do you think? So I was, I was thinking to myself, I need help. And I had to really expand my ways of thinking. And it required much more studying and much more in-depth research. The discussions were so stimulating. So I'm really in love with my PhD degree. And I would like to add to what um, Dr. Rashid was saying, that it does make you uh, more credible to the, to the outside world. Um, the, even if you're talking to an audience and let's say for instance one person has a master's, one person has a PhD, people would more recognize or go towards a person who has a PhD. It's just the psychology of it. But for myself personally, I really enjoyed achieving and earning my PhD degree. I would like to add to what everyone has said up to this point. Once I received my PhD, I continued to work for many years, and I thought about uh, the master's degrees, and I just wanted to put it out there that I felt like master was the wrong label for that degree. I think that that is just too much flattery in, that, in the name of that degree, that someone is a master at something, because that's not quite true. And when I did receive my PhD, it was a very humbling experience. You learn so much. Your research and your thinking that you have to do, just as Dr. Sims said, and then to be able to um, produce and express that information in an articulate manner, that is what the PhD gives you. You have your peers reviewing your work, uh, and it becomes a community effort. You're no longer a consumer, you're a producer. And so that is what I really like about having a PhD. Thank you very much. So next question, please. What do you know now that you wish you knew while you were pursuing your PhD? I'd like to answer that question. Um, looking back on when I was working, as, uh, working towards my PhD, I wish I had a mentor. I went through the PhD program on my own and experienced um, many obstacles and barriers that I would never have been able to um, overcome. So I realized that the key was actually having a mentor. Um, not ha without having a mentor, you will feel lost at times and you're not sure which direction you should go from where you're at. Um, I do have a, I did have a PhD program advisor, and that was great to be able to communicate with my advisor, but my advisor wasn't always available. Sometimes on evenings and weekends, I needed someone to be there for me to be able to just talk and get stuff out. I'll give you an example. There was one terrible obstacle that I really had to get through in a PhD program. It was a statistics class that I was going through, and a professor actually blocked me, wanted to block me from taking the class. 
um, I came along with two professional interpreters to be able to take the class. I did have a pre-session with the professor so that um, the professor understood the ins and outs of the Americans with Disabilities Act. But when I tried to register for that class, the professor actually wanted to block me completely from taking the course. So I actually had to f uh, file an ADA um, compliance complaint. And I also had problems there receiving services. So what I went, what I did is I went to the PhD director um, of the of PhD program, spoke to the higher up. The professor was actually reprimanded for what they did. I spoke with my advisor. I had my advisor support. So then the second day of class came, and the professor com um, told myself and the two interpreters to sit near the wall, all the way on the side of the classroom. And I really was feeling all torn inside. You could imagine going through this while I was already in my PhD program with so many responsibilities. And I realized I needed to have a mentor to navigate with me through this journey from beginning to end. That way I would be able to know and ask for the wisdom and support that I would have needed to navigate the journey uh, more better. better. This is Dr. Fellows. What I wish I had known is that the people who I thought were gonna be there for me really were not there for me. I really did think they were going to be and I was very sad to, about that. I also realized that I had to pick my battles. There were different people who I thought were gonna be in my corner but I wish I had known that it wasn't gonna be smooth sailing. But now I do. I'd also like to add I wish I uh, knew better how to prepare and how to uh, get through my thinking process. So one of my uh, mentors, Dr. Arlene Kelly in my department, talked about how she organizes her uh, information and her papers, her articles, and anything related to her research and dissertation topic into a filing cabinet. And so I used that uh, as a tool for preparing. However, I was already far into my program without having had that type of organization at the front end of my studies. So I would have liked to have um, had more preparation at the front end of my studies. I just had another thought. This is Dr. Fellows. As you're doing your paperwork, keep track of everything. Make sure that you cite every single thing you do. Sometimes you're looking through a, a particular piece of research and not able to quickly identify. So as you're reading, be sure to make notes of all of your citations, keep track of them. And that was one thing that I wish I had done. It would have saved me quite a lot of time. This is Dr. Mary. One of the one of the aspects I wish I knew but I didn't know is to take advice from someone else. Um, Dr. Steven um, Weiner here at, um, is he here? Is Dr. Weiner here? The provost? Yes, he is great, great. Um, actually, Dr. Dr. Weiner told me, um, you know that you can, you know, after you're finished with your bachelor's degree, go straight into the um, doctorate program. And at that time, I felt like a PhD would have been too overwhelming and I wasn't ready for it. So I decided to go the route to get my master's degree and then afterwards get my PhD. So I, it, was, it was a lot of work um, thinking about, you know, in hindsight. So I wish I had gone directly into the PhD program right after I got my bachelor's. Um, at the same time, I did have um, benefits from going through the master's program that actually helped me to prepare myself better. Um, I was actually had more credit, so it, the PhD program was um, very competitive. So I had much more on my academic resume that I could show. So if I wanted to go directly from the BA to the PhD program, which is a highly competitive um, field to get into, it would have been much more difficult. But obviously going through the masters was much more work. I had my comp test, I had to go through my thesis, and then I had to go through my PhD comp test and also my PhD thesis that I had to develop. So it was um, quite a bit of work. Would anyone else like to add? All right, next question, please. So how useful is having work experience before beginning the study of your PhD? This is Dr. Harrison. My work experience was very helpful to me in determining 
what my topic that I was going to use for my PhD. As I was preparing my study, I looked at my work experience and it helped me decide exactly what I wanted to focus on during my PhD program. This is Dr. Guteng. Work experience can actually help you to understand the relationship between theory and practice. I was able to utilize my experience and apply that to the theories I was developing during my courses. Secondly, my work experience also helped me to develop the right type of questions for my thesis. So I, these questions were based on my work experiences and, and from the professional relationships I was able to have and I was able to bring that collective um, experience into the classroom and help myself to develop that. So I could develop more in-depth questions and I had a more in-depth understanding of the content and so I was able to relate the theory and the practice. This is Dr. Fellows. It's very important to have work experience prior to entering a doctoral program because, again, applying the theory to practice makes your study much easier. And it's also very important to have work experience while you're working on a PhD. I did not do that. In my situation, I had a child and I was not working full time and I was taking classes and there was knowledge that I wasn't able to really apply to my study and I think that that had an effect on my ultimate um, progress as I was moving through my degree. And I do think my studies ended up being more difficult because I didn't have the work experience while I was in the doctoral program. So I would offer that you would keep up with your work. I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I think it's important to work first and then apply for your PhD programs and in fact I think it should be a requirement because it's very important to be able to apply the theory to work that you've already done. Any final comments? Dr. Sims, um, I don't know, we, time is going fast so I guess we have to move on to the next question. Next question please. After attaining your bachelor's degree, did you immediately pursue your PhD, enter a master's degree program, or work for a while? I graduated in May of 1977 with my bachelor's degree. After that, I flew to Alabama to visit my mom and my sisters and my family. And then I flew right back to Washington, D.C and went to graduate school. So I took the time over the summer to enjoy my life and my family, but I knew that I wanted to get right back into work and studying my master's uh, that following fall. My PhD came much later. I'm trying to think how many years. Uh, I think that So I had gotten my master's in 79 and got my PhD in 80, 88. So I got into the program in 88. And then in 1996, I started my PhD studies. So I had uh, a lot of time between my master's and my PhD, but I did know that I wanted to receive my master's and PhD. It was just a matter of timing. This is Dr. Angela McCaskill. I got my master's degree in 1980 from Alabama State University and after I graduated I immediately started my bachelor's degree and then I started a master's program at Howard University and I completed that program in three years and I took one year off before I started my PhD program and I started taking one class at a time because I have always worked. I've never had the luxury of not working. And it was very, very challenging. But anyway, it took me 10 years to complete my PhD. 10 years. But I decided it did not matter. I remember when I started the program, I wasn't married. During the time I got married, I had two children. I got divorced. 
I moved out on my own, but I continue to work raising my kids, juggling, and it shows if you have faith and determination, there are no barriers that you can't overcome, and you must dream beyond your situation. You think your situation is so bad, it's not true. Don't even go there. This is Dr. Fellows. Um, when I graduated from Gallaudet, I had no plan to um, get my master's. I, like I said, school was not my thing. Um, you know, I was working uh, at a deaf school in Missouri. And, and someone asked me to go, in, go into a program with them. And so I went to the, into the um, program and I left and came back and later on finished my master's but I realized that I really needed that if I wanted to be able to get the kind of job I wanted. So I decided to complete it, and I, I finished it. And PhD at that time, be having a PhD was very far from my mind at that time. Um, but then I realized that if I really wanted my dream job, I needed to get a PhD in order to do that. And really, um, it's been a 15-year um, labor that I've had to take in order to get the degree that I needed. And now, it took me 10 years as well. And my excuse was that I was married, I had a full-time job, I had three daughters who were born during my PhD studies, and so those were my excuses. I was working full-time and having my three daughters born, and it was a lot. And um, that's what happened for me. And if, if I could add, it took me a total of 14 years to complete my PhD. But you finished, that's the point. <laughs> and I certainly had obstacles along the way. I divorced, I became a grandmother, my son was called uh, to war, I put on a hold on all of my study because I had many sleepless nights when my son was out in the field. And that took about two years. Once my son returned to the homeland in one piece, I was able to refocus myself to my studies and throughout to the completion. And so, like you said, faith is so important. That's right. Dr. McCaskill, ultimately, if someone goes full time, they can finish in about three years, but most people don't do that. Most people have lives, they work, they have kids, and a variety of other things going on. So a, a, vari a, a different number of years are required for different people. Well, thank you so much for answering these questions. I'll actually bring up another MC to continue a asking these questions. Were you the first person in your family to obtain a PhD? And if so, how has this influenced your relationship with family members? Dr. Harrison, in my family, I was the first person to go to college. I was the first one to get a master's degree and a PhD. It didn't have any influence on my family relationships, none whatsoever, actually. This is Dr. Moore. Um, even though I'm not the first person in my family to have attended college, uh, many of my family members have, but I am the first person in my family to receive a PhD degree. So that's a, a, a big matter of pride for my family. <laughs> and so some, when, they, when my family see me, they say, hey, Dr. Liz, um, hey, Dr. Betty, that's my childhood name. Um, so they're like, hey, Dr. Betty. So I decided to set a rule for them not to call me Dr. Betty. I am a family member. They're not to call me by my, by my um, title. So it's so inspiring for my family to have someone who has a PhD degree. It means a lot to my family members. And I'm so blessed to have such a wonderful family who is so very supportive of me. This is Dr. Carolyn McCaskill. I wasn't the first one. Angela was actually the first one in our family. <laughs> but, but she's the oldest. But she's the oldest. And she always has to tell my age. <laughs> always. So I wasn't the first one, but my mother always really was very proud of both of us. And people say, how are your daughters doing? And my mom says, well, which one do you mean? Dr. Carolyn McCaskill or Dr. Angela McCaskill? 
And or do you mean my other daughter, who's the director of the EEO? Or do you mean this, this, or this? So it's really nice in our family. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to our next question. So given the current economy and job market, what would you say to a student weighing the costs of pursuing a PhD? This, this is Dr. Harrison. It is worth it. I do feel it's worth it. Dr. Carolyn McCaskill, the economy changes, the job market fluctuates, and regardless of any of those circumstances, it's important for a person to keep their eye on the prize. Regardless of what's going on with the economy, regardless of what's going on with the job market, it does not matter. Because by the time you complete your program, the job market may be good and you already have your education. You have your degree. So don't let that stop you. We'll have one more person comment. This is Dr. Sims. Um, to be honest with all of you, um, there's a lot of money out there to be made um, to provide support. Um, there are foundations that um, provide scholarships and grants. So if you take the time to look, which is the effort that you need to put in, I, for instance, got a full scholarship ride um, through my entire college career to my PhD, but you really have to um, um, dig those up. If you um, get loans, then you have to end up paying those back. All of my three children, I gave them the responsibility to make sure that they need to look and search out those scholarships and grants. So I was able to accomplish that for them. So there's lots of money out there to be given. And um, obviously, if you are a minority, if you have a disability, if you're a deaf, if you're a woman, if you're um, in one of the technical fields such as science and mathematics, there is a lot of money out there to be given. So you need to you know, dig up that hidden treasure. This is Dr. Moore. I would like to add to what Dr. Sims said. It's your job to research this. Some jobs offer educational assistance. Of course, you have to seek an employer who has the willingness to allow you to have your knowledge and skills match what it is that you're going after in your studies. But if you can make a case for that, you can often get money to support you. That was how I was able to get money to get through Gallaudet with the educational benefits. And I'm very grateful to Gallaudet University. If not for that, I wouldn't have my PhD. I don't believe I would. Dr. Rashid, I would like to add, uh, you don't necessarily have to work for Gallaudet University to uh, get these supports, but I was actually uh, a recipient of the Graduate Fellowship Fund, which was established to uh, support deaf people to pursue their PhDs at any university. So you're right, there is money out there. This is Brianna, the MC. I'm going to make a note of that. Thank you for those ideas. Let's move on to the next question. So the question is, did you have a mentor or role model who encouraged you to obtain your PhD? Um, someone who pushed you along to accomplish your goals. How influential were they in helping you to do that? Dr. Angela McCaskill, my sister was my role model. As I was growing up, I kept my eye on her and she was an absolute bookworm. We have opposite personalities. She's an introvert and I'm the extrovert. She was always inside studying in the summertime. I said, girl, come on outside, what are you doing? So she's just the opposite of me. I watched her, and she won many awards for reading books during the summer. So she became my role model, and I looked up to her. And then in the doctoral program, my role model was Dr. Marshall. Dr. Bill Marshall, are you here, Dr. Marshall? Hi, Dr. Marshall. Because of that man, Dr. Marshall, please stand and be recognized. I cannot tell you that man has influenced me in more ways than I can even share. When I was a doctoral student, he was a tireless supporter of me. He knew I was running a race and he said, in that last lap of the race, you're gonna be tired. 
And he said, come on. He ran with me the entire lap. I thank you, Dr. Marshall. Another important person that I'd like to mention, earlier we talked about the 12. 12 people in the United States. And his program, Administration and Supervision, has graduated eight of them from his program. Not only graduated, but all of them are very successful. So thank you, Dr. Marshall, for your outstanding leadership. This is Dr. Carolyn McCaskill. I'd like to thank my sweet sister for her comments. And it's true, I was a bookworm, and I still am a bookworm. I still love books. Um, my role model I need to mention again is um, Dr. Glenn Anderson. Because every time I saw Glenn, he was always reminding me, you got to get that PhD. And so I started trying to <laughs> hide from him and avoid him. And anytime I'd see Glenn, I'd go the other way. But, you know, Dr. Roz Rosen um, is another person who has been a wonderful mentor to me. And she, they would be like, Carolyn, mm, you got to get that PhD. And again, there would be another person that would try to sneak away and avoid. But the next time I saw her, I was able to tell her that I was in the PhD program. And I, told, I reminded her that she reminded me of that, that the sky is the limit. And um, Rose, Ms. Dr. Rosen always emphasized that, that the sky is the limit. So there's no limits that you should place for yourself. And I'd like to second what Carolyn, um, and what Angela, Dr. Ann McCaskill said about um, Dr. Marshall. I was in his program too. And when I was working on my dissertation, um, the work that I was doing was very challenging. I was researching on um, the educational experiences of deaf black Americans. And you know, looking back on that, um, the residential school experience, their exposure to sign language, and we're explaining to Dr. Marshall all about it, and he was in 100% supporting um, my, my endeavor. And sometimes when you're in a PhD program, there are times of sadness, uh, the times of discouragement when you don't feel like you can accomplish that. So I was able to talk to Angela. And I vented to her. Right. So this is. And I was able to vent to Dr. Marshall and also Dr. Rosen also helped me to stay positive too. So those were my main more role models. And also within my department, I'm so grateful to them too. Um, MJ, uh, Bianvenu, um, there were people also who asked me to serve on various committees, who asked me to present in different places. And MJ would be the one to tell me, no, you need to focus on your dissertation. Arlene Kelly, Ben Bahan, um, everyone within my department was so supportive. Um, the provost also, Dr. Steve Weiner, he was my classmate. I don't know if you all know that, that um, Dr. Weiner was actually a classmate of mine from back in 77. So he was very supportive. So these were all persons who played key roles in me being able to achieve that. I would not have been able to achieve my doctoral degree without your support. I really have to be saying, I really have to say that. I've had family support friend support, there will be people who will be there for you. Okay, and our final question. What advice would you give to a student of color who aims to enter a PhD program? Dr. Sims, I say the same thing to you that I say to my children. First of all, Find out what it is you're passionately interested in and go for it. Go all the way. Because you either have to love or hate it. They're actually both sides of the same coin. You need to know that. You have to find out what it is and go until you reach the end. You will face obstacles and frustrations and depressions and, and barriers. But ultimately, you'll reach your goal. And... The, per the person who has been very supportive in me finishing everything that I've ever done, who's been there for me throughout everything that I've ever done, find out who those supporters are. If you're interested, talk to Dr. Merritt. As he said, Everyone is not going to be there for you. Different people are different ways. If you really want a PhD and you're motivated for it, go for it. And expect that it's going to be hard work. Expect that uh, you're going to have to work at it. And remember that a PhD is not for everyone.
go digging for it. And I also want to add that it's very important to create a network of people because when you network with people, then you're people begin to know what you're doing and can support you even better. They can refer you to certain resources that are out there if they know what you're doing. So seek out that support. This is so we'd like to, um, we'll have um, Brandon continue with the next questions. So we're nearing the end. Uh, maybe we could just have one or two of the panelists. We sure wish that we could go more in depth in this discussion because um, these next three questions are pretty profound. So we apologize, but we need to take advantage of the time we have left. Um, we know that there's so many different of systems of oppression um, that we have to confront racism, sexism, autism. Um, so when you were going through your doctoral studies, um, what type of oppression did you, what type of oppression did you experience? I mean, and now that you have accomplished and you do have a PhD, are you still confronted with those same experiences today? Dr. Merritt, in a nutshell, as I said, the invisible barriers that you have to overcome, the black side of me and then the deaf side of me, I actually was more aware of the barriers I was facing as a deaf man and dealing with the diversity. And then being biracial, as I went into my PhD lab, you know, microbiology is a very diverse field. It's very, the person that I was working with in my lab was Lebanese. And as I worked through that program, I had to overcome challenges. But then as a deaf man, I had to overcome challenges of autism as well. Brandon, can anyone um, comment as to sexism or racism? I would also often visit schools and present and counsel teachers. And so when I would go there, I would always ask for time to meet with the students because I wanted the students to see me as a role model. And to this day, it's incredible to see children who still have a hard time believing that I have a PhD. So many of the children that I meet today want to um, become barbers or, or stylists. And they tell me, you're lying, Dr. Sims. You, are, you do not have a PhD. And that, that breaks my heart. Even though they see that I'm presenting and that I am where I am. But just as Dr. Merritt has mentioned, the, those invisible barriers, those unwritten rules, those expectations that are out there of what you are and what you should be, you know, even at these schools with these children who are wanting to become hairstylists, they're being encouraged to take that track and there's nobody there challenging them to take a different track. So uh, administration needs to set a tone within their schools to tell their teachers also to spread the message that all of these students can achieve much more than what they're currently dreaming of. And so, um, you know, regardless of racism and autism, um, there are many issues out there that are very strong. Brandon, next slide, please. So, um, you know, do you feel that it's easier for people of color in general to obtain a PhD now than in the past? This is Carolyn McCaskill. I don't know if it's easier. I think it's better. The opportunities are more available now. I think the financial support is there and better. Easier? I'm not sure I would say that. Dr. Moore, and then thinking also about the relationship um, of a support system, and and it's not any more of where you have the support system of maybe a majority minority group. Um, like if you look at us, for instance, where twelve of us we happen to have full time jobs, we're heavily involved in co in the community and in committees, and we are available to those who in the future would be interested in getting a PhD degree. There are so few of us in comparison to other groups of people. So I think it would be very challenging for us to be able to help those who would like to get there. Dr. Sims, this is the first time we've ever been together. February 21st, 2012. This is the very first time we've ever been together. We've got a long, long way to go. You know, we're babies. And this is the first time we've ever been together. It may be easier than the past. And hopefully we've established a foundation and you can stand on our shoulders but you will still have to deal with racism it's a fact of life 
and it's not going anywhere. Autism is present, and it's not going anywhere either. I just want to add that the key is believing in yourselves. Brandon, next slide, please. Can I give you a moment to read the question? So now when you look out at the Black Deaf community, do you see specific issues that are um, going on that need to be confronted in the community today? And what are you help doing to help resolve these? Dr. Rashid, as Dr. Sims mentioned, low expectations are there for high school or students at other levels. When they look at me and find out I have a PhD, they don't believe that I do and they don't believe that I've gone through that. I don't think I'm anything special, but many of the students find it unbelievable. The expectations are very, very low. And as Dr. Mentioned, Dr. Merritt mentioned, having a level of self-confidence is important. For me, I didn't have that. I felt as a black deaf woman, there was too many obstacles against me. And then when things happen, I would always question whether it was because I was black or deaf or a woman or any of the different things that I could get into, but uh, whether I was being chosen because I was a token or being asked to be on committees or, you know, filling the diversity needs. And, you know, it happened over many, many years. And I think many of us black deaf people feel very dejected because of that. Now my response is, really, we can go as far as we want if we have something, to, some place to start. Start somewhere, and then you can move from there. Often when I go to speak, I don't necessarily want to go, but I, I feel like I need to because there's so few of us, and it's very sad, and I feel that we have to represent. We have to show people that it's possible. Yes, racism is still there, autism is still there, uh, discrimination is still there, but we have to achieve anyway. Dr. Hairston. This is Dr. Hairston. So, um, in, within the black deaf community, we do confront issues today. I do believe um, that we don't have enough uh, exposure. Um, as far as what I'm doing about it, I've retired, and I do plan to become more involved as a mentor in the community. So I'm willing to meet with um, some of these black deaf students who are young and willing to, to do the work. And I do look forward to being able to set up that type of uh, mentorship relationships in the future and expose myself to the black deaf community and, and mainly to um, black deaf children because um, that is um, my goal, my objective. This is Dr. Sims. It starts with young people. This is Dr. Angela McCaskill. The time is 1.50. We need to move on to the next question. Well, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, next, we have a trivia game with some awards, and we'd like to move on to that. This is Elena. Um, everyone ready to participate? Let's get lively. Let's, let's get awake and get ready. We do have a couple of prizes that we'd like to give away for some of you if you're able to answer the questions. So you need to turn your minds on at this time. Our first question is, who is this man and what is his notable achievement? Does anyone know? Have someone over here answering on the right side? Glenn Anderson. Right. Joel Garcia, he answered correctly, so he gets the, um, or he gets the prize. <laughs> so very good. We, let's move on to the next question. Who was the first female black deaf PhD recipient? Anyone know? You have the answer here in front? We have this person here in front. Lindsay Dunn answered Shirley Allen. Yes, Brandon, you're right. Brandon is saying yes, that is correct. You have, you have the right answer. I think probably she's already read all those books. He has already read all those books. So we'll give you after the program is over, we can hand those um, the price to you. Or if you'd like to come up now, that's fine. Who was the first black deaf female PhD recipient at Gallaudet University? <laughs> 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 
Dr. Lorraine Sims. Yes, I cheated. I pointed out Dr. Angela McCaskill. I cheated. Um, Brandon says, someone answered. They said Dr. McCaskill, but which one? Yes, that is correct, Dr. Angela McCaskill. So right here in front, you answered correctly. Black deaf male to earn a PhD from Gallaudet University. Anyone has the answer? We have someone answering over here. Dr. Ernie Hairston. This young man on the front Ernest row. Ernest Hairston. That's what, yeah. All right. Good job. <laughs> All right. Next question. Who is this woman pictured here, and what is her notable achievement? Yes, she is a lawyer. What's her name, though? That's right, Claudia Gordon. Come on up for your prize. What is the approximate numeric range of black deaf doctorates in the U.S.? No. Three. All right, come on up. Number three. What was the final answer? So we would like to honor, um, it was such a great honor to have all of our recipients, PhD recipients here today, and we would like to provide a pin for each one of you um, to show that we're so grateful for you attending today. Oh, that's um, so nice. This is nice. a special tribute from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Dr. Angela McCaskill, I would like to congratulate our students who did an outstanding job. Our students did an amazing job. I think it's very important to give students opportunities to lead because they are our future. They are our future leaders. Wonderful job, very well done. And that includes our, concludes our program. Thank you for coming, and please do remember to fill out the evaluation. Thank you. This has been a production of Gallaudet University.